Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's um, just after 8.30 in the UK. And this is our Spotlight webinar on arbitration, and particularly arbitration now and in the future. Um, the topic to be discussed today is the seventh of our series of webinars. Um, our webinar series places topical matters and leading industry lights under the spotlight. By way of quick introduction or brief introduction, I'm Damien James and I act as a delay and quantum expert in the UK, the Middle East and Africa. Um, I supplement my practice by acting as a dispute resolver in adjudications and arbitrations. In respect of arbitration, I've acted as an arbitrator in, in commercial matters construction based uh, in the Middle East and in Africa. Uh, I'm delighted to have with me today two leading lights in international construction law disputes. And firstly, um, I would like to introduce Mr. James Vander. James is the managing partner of AMW and Co, and he has over two decades experience as a lawyer. James' legal career covers expertise in all areas of Zambian law. He's both a litigator and a transactional lawyer. He offers advice to industry leading clients across all sectors of the Zambian economy. James is a lawyer at the Supreme and Constitutional Courts, the Court of Appeal, and the High Court of Zambia. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and a past president of the SADC Lawyers Association and of the Law Association of Zambia. James obtained his LLB from the University of Zambia and has an LLM in construction law and dispute resolution. I'm also delighted to be joined today by Mr. Court Egan. Um, Court specializes in domestic and international commercial disputes with particular expertise in construction and energy matters. He has experience with many major standard form contracts and brings particular expertise to disputes involving FIDIC contracts. He contributed several chapters to the book Understanding the FIDIC Red and Yellow Books. And in addition to Court's experience at Gatehouse Chambers in London, he also has the advantage of having spent time assisting Simon Hughes QC, who some of you may know, with a wide variety of cases under Indian, Qatari, UAE, Singaporean and of course English law. Today, we look at arbitration and the challenges it faces, particularly to the resolution of disputes in the construction sector. So both our guests should be well placed. It's a, a, another in our series of Anglo-African webinars and both our guests have experience of complex judicature in not only their own jurisdictions of practice, but also in international jurisdictions. Arbitration is currently challenged by the positive impact on the settlement of disputes that adjudication and mediation can have. Often, it's said, the apocalypse of arbitration, both in time and costs, does not offer a cost-effective resolution. And often, it may be said, doesn't resolve historical issues and allow the parties to engage in a positive future, and sometimes only ever results in a severed relationship. With a global focus on economic recovery, um, the industry, the construction industry itself, requires investment, and of course requires successful delivery without prolonged costly disputes. And that in itself will encourage continued investment. Stimulus is required at a time when lockdown measures, social distancing and the world of virtual working have led to a decrease in personal interaction. And that, it may be argued, is causative of more disputes. It may, we may hear today that it's causative of less disputes, but that will be one of the interesting topics to cover. Does arbitration still have a role in dispute resolution in the new norm? Dispute resolution is essential for continued economic investment. It's also an important means of maintaining the solvency of many projects and companies. The construction industry has a heavy tradition of disputes and improvements in dispute management for investors may allow greater confidence for future and continued investment. Does costly and prolonged dispute resolution no longer have a role? How can arbitration improve in the new norm? These are the type of questions that I want to put to our panelists. Um, I would ask that you do the same by placing your questions in the chat and we can pick up on those at the end of the, um, the question time. James, if I may start with you, thank you very much for joining us from Zambia. It's a, a beautiful part of the world that I know well. Um, you and I have chatted previously um, and we've discussed arbitration in the construction sector. And whilst construction dominates the practices of many as we're attending today, the first part of my question is whether arbitration is actually suited to construction disputes. And if so, then why? Um, and then secondly, and from an African, African perspective, given the international investment in the continent, how important is the seat of arbitration in your opinion? Uh, thanks, Damien, for this invitation. I appreciate it very much. You're very welcome. Um, the, the belief or the thought is still is that the arbitration is suited for construction disputes. However, education for construction disputes uh, to some extent still stand true uh, today. 
namely expertise, for instance, you're able to choose who the arbitrator will be, and uh, you be able to choose somebody who is qualified to particularly handle that uh, construction dispute. Of course, there's always the issue of the cost and time. Uh, that's another discussion. Now, why do I say that arbitration is still suited, but as a, as a second tier? Well, over the years, arbitration has become increasingly more like a litigation, especially when you have falling into the trap of litigation. Sorry, I, I, I fell up there. Can you hear me, Damien? Yeah, can hear you, Jim. Sorry. Sorry. I think uh, the, the problem has been where you have uh, lawyers uh, and litigators are like falling into the trap of litigation. And, and, and then in, in the process, the arbitration being conducted uh, as if it is a, a litigation. So that generally has been, has, and, and because of that, we've seen a shift whereby uh, adjudication has become the first tier of, of, of dispute resolution in the construction industry. This too has become common because, uh, of the, because of the forms which are used in, uh, in construction disputes in Zambia, for instance, we've got the FIDIC forms, which will always have uh, as a first tier dispute resolution procedure adjudication and then thereafter you will have uh, uh, arbitration so uh, this this really has been what we are what we are currently seeing is that yes arbitration will always be there but as a second tier the first tier being uh, adjudication uh, because of the advantages which it offers. You mentioned, uh, Damien, the issue of the, of the seat of, uh, uh, of arbitration. Yeah. That is crucial. That is crucial because, as we know, that will determine the applicable law to the, to the arbitration. So if Zambia, for instance, is the seat of arbitration, then the Arbitration Act, uh, number 19 of 2000, that's the current act which we use, the, the, the law which will be applicable. Now, wh why is that important? The importance there is seen in the issue of how, what is the attitude of the courts towards arbitration? Do they interfere or do they support the process? That's very important. So in Zambia, we, we have a very knowledgeable judiciary and very supportive of arbitration and will not interfere except only in the instances which the law provides. And those are very, very rare instances. For instance, in the setting up of the tribunal, if the parties fail, up to set, fail to set up a, a, a tribunal, or right at the end, if there was a problem with, with the award, then the courts can be called upon to, to, set, to set aside the award. But even in those instances, that it's, it's in very, very limited circumstances in which the court can set aside an, an award. So the city is very important to, to that extent. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, James. I think um, I'm going to come back to the Arbitration Act um, shortly, um, but if I can just sort of draw court into the discussion. Um, there's much talk of ADR um, and noting from both your practices, you both work across a number of jurisdictions. Um, construction, as I said earlier, needs to distill confidence in investment without the erosion of margins by excessive disputes. That's fundamental part of business within construction. Court, if I can bring you in here, it's obviously, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. Um, you have a heavy focus in your practice on dispute resolution. Um, my, my question for you really is whether arbitration will eventually be superseded by mediation and adjudication or whether there's a place for all forms. And I know James has touched on as being second tier, but if, if you take to my second part of the question, we do see lots of arbitrations. And I think an important issue for me is what do you expect for the future of international arbitrations? What have we learned from dispute resolution during the pandemic? And I know I'm, I'm morphing into a third question, but it's just to help with the second question. Do you expect to see in-person arbitration being avoided and the virtual environment becoming the norm? I guess in simple terms, 
court, what is better, what is worse, where do we sit in the whole adjudication arbitration process for the future? Uh, morning, all, and, and thanks for inviting me. Um, take, taking that stage by stage then, I think from my perspective, the number one question really is what does the client hope to get out of the process? And that kind of drives the particular method uh, of dispute resolution that you're going to adopt. Because particularly from my perspective, if I draw my experience in the UK of adjudication, for example, there you tend to be driven by clients that want quicker results that they can leverage for particularly cash flow reasons and then obviously we have a very supportive court system here where such decisions will be enforced in pretty short time so with adjudication here it tends to be a you want a, a short uh, sharp process and that tends to be the the main driver mediation tends to be cost driven shall we say in the parties are interested in without having to launch an adjudication, without having to incur the cost of going to arbitration or litigation, is there a way that we can get in a room with a, a neutral third party and effectively hash this out and come to a resolution that we're all happy with? Arbitration and, and litigation to me are, well, in my practice, tend to be the very last resort, i.e. the parties have tried to resolve it by other means and then effectively decide that they've not got to an outcome that they can both live with. And that's when arbitration comes in. So in my view, there's always going to be a role for all those different elements of dispute resolution, because it's always going to be driven by uh, the clients and particularly their commercial situation, because that's going to be the, the key driver as to what, what method they choose to pursue. And it, and, from my perspective, international arbitration is always going to play a significant role in construction disputes because it is a very specialist discipline. I know some people think you can dip in and out of it and, it, and it's not particularly specialised, but in, in my view, it really is. And that's why it lends itself very well to international arbitration. You know, if you look at the makeup of an international arbitration panel that you can get with, you know, say a retired former judge, a QS under delay expert, then in those circumstances, you've got the various disciplines and construction all covered. Whereas I know that a lot of clients would be concerned about going to some national courts and worried about whether the judges would have all those areas of expertise covered. And I think particularly in Africa and also, well, mostly in Africa, I would say there's also the concern about neutrality in some countries, that particularly if you're acting for foreign parties against a state entity, I think a lot of clients in those particular circumstances are, are worried whether that be valid or not. They're worried about whether they're going to get, shall we say, it being cloaked or a fair crack of the whip in those circumstances. And coming then to the, the final question, really, about what, what's going to be the new normal, well, I think that's difficult to say at this stage. I think at present, things are still progressing remotely. I think we've all been... Uh, zoomed and teams etc out to the extent that everything's been proceeding like that for quite some time now and that's become kind of the default normal as and when it is but yet you know as I was saying when I when I spoke to you earlier on in the week I think there is a cultural element there in that some clients do particularly like to uh, basically sit, see what they see what they're getting out of the process they like they like you there and they like to be able to interact with you in person uh, to discuss how things are going. So I can think of clients from various different continents. I have some clients in Europe who their culture is they insist on face-to-face -face meetings. So I'll have to travel to do that. But I've also had a case in the Middle East last year where the client was almost insistent on us being there for the actual arbitral hearing. So again, I think it will come down to uh, the clients to a large extent but in terms of the procedures in terms of the tribunal the directions that they give I would expect there's going to be a lot more acceptance of things happening uh, remotely for some time. Okay excellent and um, just in terms of the point you made there in terms of managing the process uh, how do you how do you manage the discussions in terms of um, witnesses of fact how, how do you get the the production of the statements 
um, through the virtual environment. Is, is it more or less effective than actually being in person? I mean, obviously, because being in person, having somebody under pressure and having the little tells and the signs of how they feel about something, how confident they are in someone, are you, are you generating the same process through the virtual environment or is it more difficult? I think it, it's, it is more difficult. I prefer to be in the room whenever, whenever I'm doing my own witness handling because, as you say, I think it's very important to be there in the room to pick up on the tells, to pick up on uh, how the tribunal or how the judge is viewing it as well, I think is significant. Because when you're actually in a hearing room or when you're in a courtroom, you've got a 360 perspective because you can see how it's going down with the witness, but you can also see how it's going down with the tribunal or the judge. Yeah. I think that's particularly important. You, it's very difficult when you're on Zoom, for example, to be looking at the witness and looking at the tribunal at the same time to, to gauge their reactions. Um, so my, my preference would always be for things to be done uh, in person. But as I say, I think it is a new default normal that I think, for example, our eyes have probably become, become more sensitive and, and more focused. Um, and I think you do have to also question when plotting out your uh, questioning, you know, is this the best method to get this across via Zoom or uh, Teams or whatever platform you're going to use? Absolutely. OK, thank you very much, Court. It's a very interesting yeah, answer. Could I, I think it's, um... I just, could I just add on that point, Damien? Um, I agree with what where you you would want to have you know gauge what the tribunal is saying during an in-person hearing, but just the aspect of your question about preparation of witnesses prior to the to the hearing. The one experience where uh, I, I had uh, in one arbitration, we had twenty over twenty witnesses in countries and seven different cities. So to have all of those in one room and get them to my chambers for preparation of, of their witness statements and, and preparations for trial would really have been very costly. But because of the restrictions of COVID, we were able to do this via uh, the Zoom platforms. We set up a, a Dropbox where witnesses could access their, the, their witness statements and make corrections and view all the documents which we had available for use for trial. And our estimate is that that cut down the cost which would have expended by 20%. Extent, uh, the, the, the virtual platforms are very useful in arbitration in keeping down the cost. Okay, excellent. I, I wanted to ask you, um, James, obviously, you know, my experience of Africa is that site inspections are incredibly important. I don't mean for for everybody who's party to the arbitration, but definitely for, for someone like myself in terms of an expert. And, and, and that in itself is a challenge. Um, and it's been a challenge over the last um, two, three years, no doubt. Um, how, how important is that in respect to the African perspective? And then if there's a failure to, to have that site inspection, does it affect the success of arbitrations in Africa? Um, and then obviously maybe you can just contemplate that and we can think about where we sit with nominating bodies right now in Africa and, and how they can be beneficial, whether they are in country and recognize those problems and avoid the default position of the ICC, which causes further complications to site visits. And then really from a Zambian perspective, an African perspective, how, how do parties ensure that the provisions of a contract or the nomination form or the nomination clauses within a contract can deal with all these um, unique aspects of, of the African continent and the matters that we have there? Site inspections uh, uh, would, would, would really be important. Well, it would depend on the nature of the case. Um, it, it, the one thing which would be an issue would be access to certain sites. Uh, and, and that could bring in the issue of, of course. That's the one thing. The second thing uh, with, with site inspections is to get uh, experts, the right type of experts, to be available uh, to inspect the sites and to be available to uh, to present the to be available for you during the trial or to be your expert during the trial. The one thing which is limiting in our jurisdiction is that uh, the, the the parties who you would want to appoint as arbitrators 
to sit on your on your on your panel in a construction dispute. Uh, the engineers, for instance, the geotechnical engineers or structural engineers, the ones whom you'd want to be on your arbitral panel, would be the the same ones whom you 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 would expect to appoint as your as your experts to on behalf of your of your client. So there's a limit to that extent, and therefore you tend to look to outside the jurisdictions. For instance, in Zambia, we tend to get experts, geotechnical experts or structural experts from South Africa to come and testify. And so getting them to, to site, uh, to inspect uh, those sites is a, is a huge issue because of the cost involved. It's, it's what it is. now. You, you, you talk about uh, the, the issue of nominating, uh, nominating bodies in Africa and how successful has arbitrations been in, in Africa. The one thing we, 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 we have to look at, Damien, is uh, we have to see, to define what success is, is in the context of, of arbitration. Do we get an award in the most efficient and economical manner in Africa? I think... Over the years, African arbitrations have, have, have improved uh, tremendously compared to where we were not too long ago. You have to remember that there were a lot of misconceptions about African arbitration uh, procedures and African uh, arbitrators as uh, such issues as uh, interference, national courts, an issue which court mentioned, inadequate qualifications amongst arbitrators, and sometimes the misconceptions of, of corruptions. Also, as Africans, I think at times we did not help ourselves in this regard as we had a lot of arbitrations seated in foreign jurisdictions like the UK or France. So African disputes were being settled in Europe. Now, African governments were especially culpable in this regard as almost all agreements, bilateral agreements or any other investment agreement signed had arbitration clauses which no one paid attention to, at least from our side. Nobody was paying attention to these arbitration clauses. A single line in that, in that agreement, like for instance, French law will be applicable in the event of a dispute. That obviously disqualifies all the lawyers in Zambia and, and arbitrators alike. You will have to appoint a French lawyers without dispute, and this is real. Uh, at one time, uh, Damien, I was in Mozambique. I met uh, the Chief Justice of, of Mozambique. He raised this similar issue uh, about a construction project in Mozambique, where there was a which says all different English law will be applicable. Mozambique uses is, is, is Lusophon, Portuguese law. So no one in Mozambique was qualified for that. So to that extent, we, we do bear to bear the, the, the blame. So each time there's a dispute arising from those agreements, as I said, foreign lawyers, foreign arbitrators had to be uh, appointed. And of course, the cost was tremendous. But over the years, however, things have, have improved. We do have competent international arbitration, arbitration centers, which would make and have made the arbitration process more uh, affordable. A, a recent survey which I, I saw lists uh, the top five arbitral centers in Africa as uh, APSA, uh, AFSA, uh, sorry, which is the Arbitration Foundation of South Africa. Then you've got the Cairo Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration, the Ogadugu Arbitration and Mediation and Conciliation Center. You've got the Ohada Common Court of Justice. And then you've got the Kigali International Arbitration Center in, uh, in, in Rwanda. So all these are there and they provide quality and competent uh, arbitrators. Now, <clears throat> although some standard forms like FIDIC, for instance, uh, prescribe what the arbitral uh, nominating body will be. FIDIC, for instance, says it's the ICC. Uh, based on current experience, it is expected that such sub clauses, such clauses in these standard forms will be amended by the parties uh, to allow for local or regional arbitration bodies to appoint and manage the, the uh, a situation which has been very common in the past is where international funders have resisted and say, yes, uh, there has been success uh, in as far as cost has been, has been brought down, 
as compared to when arbitrations are, are held uh, in, in Europe. But, but of course, there will always be challenges. And, 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 and the one challenge which I, I highlighted to narrow it down to Zambia is uh, there are very few qualified Oh, I think I've just lost you there, James. Maybe we can come back to that with the, the very few qualified. But maybe, Court, if I can bring you in just while James resolves his um, technical issues. Um, arbitration in the virtual norm, as James said, probably preferred to litigation and the lottery of circuit judges, which you touched upon, um, and those people who may know very little about technical aspects of construction disputes. Is, is it more important now with the advent of the virtual norm that the choice of arbitrator or tribunals reflects the expertise required by the parties to resolve their dispute? And, and secondly, how do you ensure that the choice of virtual arbitrator, his or her understanding is correct and ascertaining the key issues and understands the technical aspects correctly? So I, I think in terms of um, have the has the new norm changed anything with regards to the expertise required by arbitrators? I actually think that that's not so much changed. I think we are still, uh, as litigators or those involved in arbitration, we are still looking for effectively the same things that often when a dispute lands on your desk, you get a good sense of, you know, what are the key issues here construction wise? You know, is this a contract dispute? Is it a delay dispute? Is it a quantum dispute? Is it a, a prolongation dispute? You have to distill very quickly what you think the key issues are. And then on that basis, I think you should be guided by that as to what particular features you're looking for in, in an uh, arbitral tribunal, in particular in a, a party appointed arbitrator. And then I think the importance of communication throughout the process is obviously taking advantage of all the opportunities you get to communicate with a tribunal really distilling it down uh, in simple terms to those key headings that we're talking about so what are the contract elements of the dispute what are the delay elements of the dispute and really breaking it down into bite-sized chunks shall we say so that it's very clear where the various areas of expertise can be applied to. I think that's probably the, the most important thing you're looking for, particularly me when I'm, when I'm drafting a pleading or where I'm drafting a submission to a tribunal, that's what I'm trying to do. Do you think, um, do you think Court, that the, the traditional arbitrator, I mean, obviously we have, we have a history of arbitrators being of, a, of a, um, an older age or a certain age, do you think they can segue or, or morph into the virtual environment as easy as, as you can as a, as a younger, younger barrister, younger advocate? Is it, is it an easy transition for them or are there difficulties for them? I think they're inevitably teething problems. So I, I think, for example, when COVID first hit, it was the same in, in courts and in arbitration that all of a sudden you had to get used to all these new things, particularly, for example, I think electronic bundles were a big thing for, uh, I'd call more experienced people uh, because, you know, they're very used to, you know, printing off in a massive case, you know, 60 leverage files and the whole, can you turn to bundle 32 page 990? You know, that was kind of the norm in terms of how cases were structured. Whereas you know, speaking from, from my own point of view, I've been solely electronic probably since I basically started in practice, you know, four or five years ago now. So for me, that it hasn't actually caused much of a difference in terms of uh, the practicalities of how disputes are being carried out. And in terms of obviously, you know, operating Zoom and Teams, et cetera, all, all the various um, platforms that we use for arbitration hearings now, you know, uh, obviously before COVID, they weren't really something in my daily diet, but it's quite easy to get used to them. So I think there were uh, some teething problems, but now I would say that again, you know, the market's adapted very quickly and remote at the moment is the new norm and people have uh, adapted very well to that now to the extent that in my experience, you wouldn't particularly notice that things were so different, you know, two or three years ago. 
do, do you think there'll there'll be a case in the in the future in respect of where virtual processes have been decided upon that a party believes or understands or you know they they, they that, that by their own compulsion they believe that they're not getting their point across in the virtual environment and they want the matter to be conducted in person do you think that will actually happen i mean do the contracts that use arbitration i mean obviously they have to ensure that parties feel adequately protected by the process whether it's virtual or in person do you think there's going to be any issues with that in the future or is it something we'll just all adapt to it, it's definitely possible because as, as i said earlier there are some parties that are more acutely concerned about the realities of a virtual hearing. You know, they would quite like to be in the room both to interact with their counsel or their advocate, but also to interact with the, well, not interact, but to see the tribunal and, and how they're reacting with things. So, you know, a lot of international clients do like to attend hearings in person. That raises the uh, question of, Will that come about merely by uh, parties making requests to attend in person? Because, for example, if we look at how things are proceeding in the courts in the UK, whilst a lot of hearings, the default is this is going to be remote, you do have liberty to apply to the court and say, you know, we would prefer this to be an in-person hearing. Um, can you please facilitate that? Whilst that may lead to some procedural wrangling as the other side say no we'd like it to be remote um and that that may lead to a, a tete-a-tete uh you know in most circumstances i think parties would understand particularly now um that we've been in this uh default normal for a few years now i think parties are more willing to come out and do things in person i think it's probably more unlikely that parties will actually make that part of the contracts because particularly in, in international construction disputes you end up having so many things to argue about when it comes to what to put in the contract that this probably falls very low down the list in terms of uh, the motivations of clients and you know, that there are a lot of things to think about when it comes to construction contracting because for example uh, I can remember very recently in a in a dispute I had in Africa where the parties hadn't expressly specified a seat and then it was a matter of the construction of contracts, how the seat would be decided. And as James mentioned, that was actually, uh, from memory, a, a Fiddick Silver book contract. And, and there the question was, well, how, have the parties indirectly given the power to the ICC to decide the seat of the arbitration? And so, so that's just another point where the contract is so important and there's so many things that you can effectively not cater for that are going to have significant consequences further down the line. I think the type of things we're talking about in terms of procedure probably fall quite low down the party's list. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we, we could sit and chat about Enka versus Chubb and where the seat <laughs> was and where the contract was for another half hour or so, but maybe that's the... That's for another day, really. Um, James, hopefully your connection is good and um, you, can, you can come back yeah. with us now. Um, as, as a lawyer and someone who drafts contracts, um, you, you, you were about to talk about the qualification of arbitrators, and I've touched on that with court in respect of... There's not only a qualification in respect of um, legal process, arbitration process, technical process, there's also the qualification which is, lends itself to being able to use electronic documents, which is a challenge in itself. Um, in terms of... From your point of view, in terms of the qualifications of the, the, the Zambian arbitrators, in terms of the contracts that will exist in, in Zambia, which will, I, I, I think I understand that we'll be, we'll be driving nomination bodies more to a local nomination body rather than the ICC, given the challenges you have. What, what do you see for the future of the arbitration clause in Zambia? Do you see many changes, subtle changes, no changes? And importantly, you did touch, touch on the Zambian Arbitration Act. Do you see that there'll be changes to the Arbitration Act itself in the, in the coming years to reflect the change in development and the, the new norm of arbitral practice? Yeah, I mean, just to complete my thought on the issue of qualifications of, of arbitrators, we have many competent arbitrators in, in, in Zambia, uh, very skilled, uh, highly competent. The issue I was raising is that with particular respect to construction disputes, the, the numbers are, are, are limited. And so, it's, it's not unusual 
to get either counsel or arbitrators from uh, from outside Zambia, especially especially from 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 South Africa. Uh, with with respect to the issue of uh, the arbitration clause uh, being changed, I, I I do not see much change much change happening uh, to to the to the clause. Uh, of course, there will always be issues which will arise about uh, uh, the. The duration of the of the arbitration, which can lead to an increase in costs, uh, but these really are dependent on the type of arbitrator whom whom you choose and how he will he will control the process. In respect of the law itself, yes, the, we we are expecting changes to to the law uh, generally with respect to arbitration. In Zambia, we've already started that process. Uh, we, the, the act which is current, currently in use was passed in 2000. So we've had it for 22 years, somewhere there. So uh, during this period, and, and the act, uh, Damian, is based on the, on the model law. So during this period, obviously there's been some uh, developments which have necessitated that the, the act be reviewed so that uh, it takes into consideration uh, recent developments uh, in, in, in the law. I'm aware, I think it is Tanzania which passed uh, uh, the, the most recent law in Africa. I think it's, it's in 2020, if I'm not mistaken, but fairly recent. So I, I do think there will be a trend in updating the legislation which is in place to take into account the developments uh, which have happened in the past few years or since the, 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 the model law was, was introduced. There has been, for instance, if I give you an example of the Zambian Act, it is based on the 1985 uh, uh, model law, but which has since been updated, I think in 2006. So those updates, we, 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 which are very, uh, very crucial, I think some to do with interim uh, applications are not uh, being used in, 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 the Zambian, in the Zambian Act. So we need to take, those into consideration. We are taking those into consideration as we update the the act. Okay, thank you for that, James. Um, Court, just just going back to the the issue of arbitration acts within different jurisdictions and the the the, the coverage that we receive from the model law. A um, couple of questions, really. Given virtual environment, some of the issues that we talk about, you know, arbitrators ability, good ability, whether they, a, a party feels good about the process or they feel bad about the process or they perceive the process to be good or bad or indifferent. Do you, do you think we'll see, is there a potential for challenges to arbitration awards? And that's probably my first question for you. Um, and the second part of that is, do you think that the model law is still best placed to manage the enforcement of awards or will we see further challenges to the model law, which will result in further changes as arbitration acts change within country? So uh, dealing with it question by question, I think in terms of will we see challenges to arbitral awards, I think there are always ch challenges to arbitral awards, regardless really of the, the governing law of the contract or where it's seated, etc. I think the point there to make is the, the success figures. Because I remember when I was working uh, on a case in the UK when I was advising on a challenge to uh, an arbitral award and I looked at the figures and in the UK, for example, it was a tiny, tiny amount of challenges to arbitral awards that were successful, despite the fact that the numbers for actual challenges were actually significantly high. I, I don't remember the figures, but I think it was something like in a year, for example, you might have a hundred challenges to arbitral awards and yet it might be two or three, for example, that are actually successful. So uh, in terms of actual challenges, I think we are always going to be challenges, but we're always going to, to face a high bar, I think, when it comes to actually setting aside arbitral awards, absent, you know, any, anything glaringly uh, obvious or bad or procedurally irregular with the actual process. And then in terms of, is the model law best placed? Well, I think that's just something that, parties have grown used to at this particular stage that's kind of again i keep using the phrase default normal but 
the model law is something that people are accustomed to and it's something that people are aware of and something that they draw confidence from. Uh, and that's why you often see it as the basis of arbitral uh, uh, legislation that's springing up around the world because you know the more the more it appears, the more certainty and the more consistency we have across the various jurisdictions. So in those circumstances, I, I see that trend continuing, uh, i.e. the model law continuing to be adopted as the basis of a number of legislative regi- regimes throughout the world. Uh, and I wouldn't think that that's going to change particularly soon. But I think that all around the world, there is a drive to ensure the proper enforcement of arbitral awards. And uh, Africa is no different as a particular drive in Africa to, to ensure that that's the case. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Can I just add one point? Yeah, on the on the challenges to, to awards. I mean, the, an important issue for, for investors really in the international arbitration circles would be uh, whether the award can be challenged on its on its merits. So the, the beauty of the of the model law and uh, which has been adopted in, in a few African and several African countries is that that can't happen. You 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 can't challenge the award on its on its merits. There are grounds, yes, which you can challenge it on. For instance, if the tribunal did not treat the parties equally, now those grounds are, are limited, and and in most instances would would not be successful because you would see parties straying into the merits. And so courts are, are, are crucial in this instance because. If you have a competent judiciary which understands what the role of arbitration is and the arbitration procedures are, then those challenges, yes, in as, in as much as they will always be there, the success rate will, will be close to close to zero because uh, the, of the limited grounds and, and not allowing you to stray into the merits to challenge the award. Okay. I think... Um... I mean, I've always gone on the basis that it's a, a pillar of law, the right to have your dispute resolved by a third party with regard to the law and the evidence. And I think maybe maybe we'd agree that arbitration is probably still the best suited um, in that respect for construction, notwithstanding what court said in respect to the adjudication process, which is the, the not not quick fix, but it's, you know, it's a decision over a shortened period of time. So um, submissions and evidences. Ought to be naturally short, actually naturally smaller, but it isn't sometimes. Sometimes it's turned into many arbitrations. Um, so if we take arbitration as being the most suited process after the opportunities to mediate, adjudicate, and the use of dispute boards, um, of both of your experiences in disputes, and definitely on an international basis, what what do you see as the biggest blockages to a successful arbitration at this point in time? Maybe James, you can come in first. The, the 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 issue of course has um, I mean the original ideas Damien on, on arbitration was that they would be uh, cost effective and and you know time wise uh, you know very efficient but this this has become a real challenge because arbitrations have become really really expensive and 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 the problem which the African experience of having arbitrations uh, being uh, seated in Europe that didn't help. It became extremely expensive, so that's that's the challenge. And and time-wise, if you've got lawyers who are there not to resolve the dispute but simply to be disruptive, the, the case will not be heard uh, uh, in an efficient manner. And if the tribunal also is composed of a panel, which you know is is not serious about ensuring that we reach the dispute then that is a challenge. So cost and time have, 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 have become a big issue for, for arbitration. Uh, and, 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 and if that is not taken care of, I'm afraid we'll have uh, serious challenges with arbitration going forward. Thank you, thank you. Court, your thoughts on that. Maybe you can put a positive spin on it to say what we can do to improve those negatives that we just addressed. I think for me, one of the, the biggest issues is actually just case management. And I think that's that's the route through in that it, it strikes me that 
well, in my experience, that one of the main things holding up international arbitration is what I would call procedural wrangling from a number of perspectives. So at the very outset of a dispute nowadays, you tend to have uh, satellite disputes about the actual appointment of the arbitrator itself. You know, that can become a, a drawn out process with parties objecting to the appointment of a particular arbitrator and you know, as we've seen in the in the UK, where a case actually reached the Supreme Court about um, the disclosure of conflicts by uh, an arbitrator, you know, that's one area where there can be significant delay as the parties get into a dispute about the identity of the arbitrator. And then beyond that, I think uh, challenges such as jurisdiction can really drag on, you know, particularly if you look at a a FIDIC-based dispute, whether it be under the 1987 form, whether you've complied with the formalities in order to get to arbitration, whether it be the, the 1999 form, more and more you see parties take the jurisdictional point that uh, they've not complied with the mandatory preconditions to arbitration and therefore uh, the claim shouldn't be heard. There are the Obviously, it's a legal dispute about whether the claims are inadmissible or whether the tribunal lacks jurisdiction. But you're seeing more of that sort of stuff. And that just lends into what James was saying in terms of it adds to the costs and it adds to the delay. And that's why in those circumstances, uh, you are looking for a way to cut through the procedural wrangling. So in terms of uh, the appointment of arbitrators, depending on the procedure, you either want the parties to work together or in circumstances where they can't effectively work together and the contract permits them to go to a nominating body to decide the constitution of a tribunal that that could be a way forward as long as the, the contract permits it and then in terms of the jurisdiction stuff i think tribunals have to address that head on you know quite early in the process and decide what they're going to do with it what they consider to be the correct approach and then uh, leave it to the parties to decide whether they want to go to national courts to take that any further to to try and halt the arbitral process. Um, so I think you know case management and uh, thinking through potential issues, but before you actually start the arbitral process, is probably key. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I think the main, obviously, I, d I didn't want it to be a negative question to say that arbitration, um, you know, is got its problems etc i mean we you know we often talk about anything other than arbitration is a poor relation of arbitration and, and perhaps given the evidential situations um or the evidential requirements within arbitration or for a dispute resolution arbitration is the best place um you know quite happy to take some questions but i'm just gonna just gonna run with those points for a second i mean obviously i think james's point has made the point about the seat of arbitration you know it's essentially important definitely for for arbitrations in the in the african continent um the, the arbitrators themselves, the qualification of the arbitrators, their ability, technical ability, legal ability, procedural ability, but also, as you say, court, their, their, their ability to manage the case and to deal with some of the legal issues that may be brought into the forum of the arbitration arena. Um, that lends itself to managing the time, that lends itself to managing the cost, and that puts the arbitrator at the fore of that situation. Um, I mean, we've mentioned we've mentioned Chubb already, but if we talk about Halliburton versus Chubb and the issue in terms of conflict, you did touch on it there, Court. Um, one of the issues that I saw is that um, definitely in my own practice, the the Zoom and the virtual, the, the Teams arena has allowed me to go from meeting to meeting and, you know, not necessarily to take on uh, more matters, but it's allowed me to be probably more proficient without the need for, for to always travel to issues. Um, for arbitrators who take on different matters in different jurisdictions where there may be a potential conflict and we don't always know when there is a potential conflict do you think that disclosure by arbitrators may become even more important in the future now as we move into that virtual environment well i think it, it's become more important now in that it as i said it's it's just that case of halliburton and child particularly in a uk setting showed the extent to which um, conflicts can lead to satellite litigation in and of itself. So the fact that that went all the way to the Supreme Court and then the Supreme Court <laughs> effectively gave a judgment saying it, it all depends on the, on the particular facts as to whether there's actually 
uh, an issue in that particular case. And they also sought to expressly limit it to Bermuda form arbitrations. So you effectively had, you've litigated it all the way to the Supreme Court and then they wanted to produce a judgment that was very confined to its facts because obviously they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't want to prescribe hard and fast rules as to what arbitrators should do and the, and the circumstances uh, in, in which the fair-minded and reasonable observer you know, would have inferred an in, unconscious bias in the circumstances. So... I think it is definitely something that um, potential arbitrators and arbitrators are uh, more conscious of, particularly, as I say, because uh, now it's almost like they've been put on notice that if a party doesn't like the appointment of a, a particular arbitrator, then that tends to be the angle that they focus on most often. You know, has disclosure properly been made? Yeah, I mean, there is a common sense approach with that because you, you do find arbitrators who some, some act as advocates and some act as some still work as barristers um, in the UK. Um, and they may be, may be representing on one side and have a tenuous link to somebody on the other side. Um, and obviously Chubb set down some fairly straightforward principles in that respect. But obviously there, there may be a challenge there. Um, and I think in, in my view, disclosure, ongoing disclosure is probably better than mm. not not giving ongoing disclosure because of the uh, the inference that people may take from it. Um, I, I guess you're probably in a similar place to me there, not notwithstanding the, the the issues that exist in the Chubb case and Bermuda and Bermuda etc. in the Supreme Court back in the UK. Um, yeah, maybe. But, Sorry, I was just going to say, I think if it's possible, I if the disclosure is permitted, then it's obviously always best to be uh, transparent. And I think the particular issue in that. Um, Halliburton case was that from memory the arbitrator was involved in a number of what I, what I would say related proceedings to do with the same incident and in those circumstances hadn't really clocked the fact maybe I should make disclosure in these circumstances and that's why the point is that really I think arbitrators should take a step back and think is there anything here that I should be disclosing to either party and anything here that if I fail to disclose that somebody might try and make, <laughs> make a fuss of further down the line? And I think that's safety first approach is always best. And well, as it is in many scenarios. Yeah, absolutely. Um, James, I'm make a to you. Yeah. Sorry, just to add on this point, sorry, yeah. Especially in a situation where you've got a limited pool of arbitrators who are skilled in a particular field. Disclosure will always be important. I mean, the, the rule is basic. If you're in doubt, disclose. Uh, before the Halliburton case, we, we had a, a case here, here in Zambia which went all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, the, the issues of an arbitrator handling one arbitration and then not disclosing in the next arbitration that is handling an arbitration for the same parties arose. And uh, the Supreme Court here didn't miss their words. They simply said, that was wrong. And the award which subsequently came where there was no disclosure was, was set aside. So especially, Damien, as you say, in the virtual environment, the virtual environment where we're having more and more hearings online, disclosure, you know, sh there should be no issue about disclosure. You must disclose, uh, period. Yeah, I, I, tend, I tend to agree. I mean, you know, I think it's whether it's safety first or just common sense, I think that's the, the approach if you are acting another matter then it doesn't doesn't make any inference. I think if you don't disclose, probably more likely to make an inference than than not. Um, James, just before we, we finish, I just wanted to come back to an issue respect of Africa and what obviously what I see. Um, I mean, obviously Africa has some support for adjudication through um, South Africa and Kenya. Um, I'm not sure it extends beyond much more territories like than that. The adjudication process, the mediation process, and even dispute boards. How can it be managed in the future um, without statutory provisions that not all disputes end up in arbitration? Because it, it seems to be the case in certain jurisdictions that even if you use the adjudication provision, because there's no statutory tool or implement behind it, the default position is, is always going to be arbitration, but you've got that tiered system. What, what can Africa do to, to change that process, that system? Should they just default to arbitration and try and avoid adjudication in total? Or is that denying people their rights for a speedy remedy? 
Yeah, I mean, if the, if the contract says you, you go to adjudication first, then you have to uh, go through adjudication. Now, the, the thing is that even without the backing of, of statute, uh, adjudication in Zambia, uh, and I think the, the, the few African countries I have followed is successful for the reason that you do have competent adjudicators. Uh, you, you have a few lawyers who are adjudicators, but mostly it's dominated by engineers who know their jobs. And, and, and usually the success is related to if the project is ongoing, uh, if the project is ongoing, the disputes which will arise will usually be of a very technical nature, which would require certain expertise. And, and, and in, in those periods, uh, somebody who is highly skilled is called upon, makes a decision. It is easy uh, for the other part of the employer in this instance to comply, especially we've seen this in public, uh, uh, in public projects, uh, uh, Damien. The, the, the huge projects obviously will be, will be public projects in, in Africa, which are funded by multilateral development banks. And there you have FIDIC obviously coming into, into play. And they will always insist on, on, uh, on adjudication and, and arbitration thereafter. Now, if it is a public project, obviously you have uh, the, the project engineer or the employer being government personnel. They, you, you would not have these make decisions easily uh, or agree with a contractor because they might be accused of colluding with a contractor. But we have seen where a decision has been passed by an adjudicator, compliance will be there because the decision has been made by a third party. So yes, there's no statute backing uh, uh, adjudication in, in Zambia and in many African countries, but there is a huge level, a high level of compliance. So to that extent, we, we, I, I would say adjudication has been very successful. And so, um, there will be obviously certain issues which are a problem without the backing of, of statute. But again, it goes back to the issues we're, dis we're discussing of how who, who do you appoint as the adjudicator? How do they manage the case? Uh, and do they, do, they, do they know that this process needs to take a short period of time to allow cash flow because this project has to go on? So it's, it's all about those dynamics. And if you get the right set of people then, then uh, the, the process will flow uh, properly. So to that extent, adjudication is still popular, even without the backing of statute, because there's a high level of compliance. Okay, so I take it from you, James, that in the, in the new norm, choice of dispute resolver is, uh, is a key takeaway. From, from your point, Court, what, what, would, what would you see in the new norm as being a key takeaway for the future of dispute resolution, whether it be arbitration, adjudication or otherwise? I, th I think the the point I would say is that a client's got a very good choice in terms of you know what method they'd like to pursue. They all have their own, I'd say, pros and cons. But clients are in a good position, and unless obviously the contract uh, mandates the dispute resolution uh, methodology that they're meant to pursue, clients are in a good position to look for themselves. You know what they want to get out of the process and, and also to look at uh, the particular framework in which they find the dispute so for example if you if you look in some countries you know a client may well be in a position where they're able to get an estimate for how long it might take for a matter to proceed uh, through the courts and that may well take years and then you'll be in a position to contrast that with well if i follow the methodology in the contract I might be able to get an arbitral dispute with through a specialist panel in a quicker period of time with potentially comparable costs. And that's why it's really up to the, the client and their advisors to weigh up what are all the possible options and what actually suits us best in the circumstances. Yeah, I think um, I, I tend to agree with you. Some of the nomination nominating bodies have developed. I mean, DIAC's developed itself in respect of capping fees and giving timelines in respect of completion of arbitration. So it's, it's, it's not similar to an adjudication process, but it has the similar principles to the adjudication process. And I think that's a, a great improvement. Obviously, the importance there is for the arbitrator to manage that process and not to allow the drift outside of that, because then we'll come back to the issues that James has raised and you've raised court in terms of time and cost. Um, and 
those considerations that people may raise in terms of jurisdiction arising from procedural irregularity. So I think there are definite improvements for the for the, the new norm as we move forward. Yes, there'll always be challenges, um, but with the the right guidance and the right people in place, I'm sure that those challenges can be can be managed either by subtle changes in contracts, subtle changes in arbitration acts, um, and subtle changes in conduct as well. Um, that brings us to the end um, now, because obviously we like to keep these spotlights to an hour just to keep them as punchy and allow everybody to get back to work. So if there are no further questions, nobody wants to raise a hand or stick a question into the question box. I'd just like to say thank you very much to both of our guests today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you both. Thank you for joining from Westminster and Zambia, respectively. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Obviously, your time is very valuable. Um, and I'm sure that your audience, our audience, appreciate your thoughts and opinions today. I definitely do. Uh, this spotlight will be available on our YouTube site, which can be found via our website, along with our previous spotlights. Um, so it leads me to say thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon to you all, depending on which time zone you're in. Thank you very much for joining us. I look forward to seeing you again at our next spotlight, probably in April. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.